Well, good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Everybody awake? You good? I'm trying to get my phone to go into like, what do you call it? This is portrait mode. This is landscape. That's nah, okay. I guess it doesn't have to be. I just want technology to work. This is my timer. That's very important. Trust me. You're like, we want you to finish at some point. Okay, the timer will help. Um, well, how about a story? I'll start with a story. Stories are good. Um, this is a true story. I, I uh, got ki- caught stealing <clears throat> the first time when I was 10, 10 years old. Um, I was a wonderful little boy. And I stole candy bars from uh, Broadway Market over in Webb City. The guy that owned the store uh, grew up in, in Webb and went to high school with my dad. And I stole uh, Snickers candy bars from him, from his store. And after I'd done that about 10 times, I got caught. And uh, Mr. Wallace caught me. And I was leaving the store. And I had the Snickers bar under my shirt. And uh, he stopped me. And, was, you know, stupid. And I long, like, I'm stupid, not him. And uh, like, <laughs> I told him, when he asked me, what do you, what do you have under your shirt, Dusty? Uh, you know, oh, oh, the Snickers. Mr. Wallace, I was, I was really hungry riding my bike home from my friend's house, and I didn't have any money right now, and so I was going to get the Snickers bar now and go home and get some money and come back and pay you. And he didn't believe me. I don't know what's up. But he took me to his office, and um, I had to call, um, you know, my parents to come pick me up. And my dad was at work, and uh, my mom was home, and she came and got me, and she paid you know, for the candy bar and then took me home. And then she sent me to my room with the dreaded words, wait until your dad gets home, right? Now, here's why I was scared. I was not afraid of my dad in a physical way. My dad uh, was and is my hero. He passed away about nine years ago of cancer, but uh, was always and still is kind of the standard of what it means to be a man in my life, my hero. But he was opposite of me in every way. He was very quiet, uh, very gentle, you know, not aggressive at all, never raised his voice. I never remember, other than him yelling at like football games, you know, and like, like cheering, he never raised his voice. I wasn't afraid of him. I respected him, and I knew I was going to disappoint him when he found out I'd stolen because, you know, he taught me not to steal, you know, and that that's wrong and all that. I was not convicted at all uh, for stealing. I was was just so nervous about my dad's face when he would come in and how he would see me now, you know, and his disappointment. So I waited there on the bed for my dad to get home. And I'll, I'll come back to that. I just, wanna, I just wanna set that up for now. And I wanna look at where we've been and where we're going, okay, for this weekend. Um, your mission is out there, but your identity is in here. And God loves you, he adores you, he likes you, he sees you and loves you just as you are. And all of that identity stuff in you, all of it rises or falls on how you think God thinks about you or how you see and view God's love. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you believe or not, but I'm telling you that God's love is big and that God's love is safe. And it's big and safe for all, regardless of where you are or who you are. Jesus lived, died, and resurrected so that you could experience this grand safe love of God. But here's what I want to say today. God's love is not meant to be a one night stand. God's love is not like this agreement only. And it doesn't, he he doesn't come to you with forgiveness and love through the person of Jesus and, you know, forgive you of your sins and give you salvation, you know, give you the promise of everlasting life and then peace out and leaves you right? And you figure out life and good luck. And, and b- because sometimes that's the message I feel like um, within the religious Christian community sometimes that like, you know, hey, you've got salvation. You'll go to heaven when you die. So like whatever happens, happens. And that's just life and whatever. But like there's this promise from God through Jesus that he will be with you. That God's love is not meant to be a one night stand, but that God is with you, and this might be the great news of the Bible. God's, God's with you, with us in a lot of ways. God's with us through his presence. Like not, not like, I, I know I have a little bit of a list, but not presence, like under the Christmas tree, but his presence. Oh, there it is. 
I wouldn't even have to make fun of myself. It's just right there, right? Oh, man, now you're going to be trying to listen to see if I have a lisp the whole time? I do. <laughs> it's not funny? Okay. Um, <laughs> I would make a note, but I won't preach this again here. So um, God's with us through his presence. He's with us. So both of my boys, Asher and Silas, when they were born, um, I went with the nurse when they did the circumcision. If you don't know what circumcision is, let me not explain it, and you can ask your parents or your youth pastor. That'd be a fun, uh, fun little conversation. But I went into the room because, and it was all symbolism for me. I just wanted to be able to be there when it happened. Now, here's the thing. I didn't tell the nurse I didn't say, hey, you know what? You know, just go ahead and don't circumcise them. I didn't like take that pain away. And man, like their little baby bodies, they were like one day old and they do the circumcision. They're just like, ah, face red. They freak out and then they fall asleep. Right? That's what happens. But I wanted to be there. And for a couple of reasons, one serious, one's more of my personality um, and silliness. But like, um, I wanted to be there for their first, I mean, I guess their first traumatic experience is like being born, right? Like that's, weird, but like their second traumatic experience, right, of, of being circumcised. I wanted to be there. I want to, I want to be with them as much as I can through the hard times, even if I won't stop it, if I do have the power to stop it, you know, even though I often won't, right? But I also wanted to be able to tell those two boys when they hit their teenage years, which one of them is there now, I wanted to be able to say, listen, you honor God with your body because I was in the room when they circumcised you and I could have said, just take it all. I mean, not that they would have done that, but my boys don't necessarily know that. And so I fear I can say that. And that's good fun. And my, my 13-year-old has already rolled his eyes because I've told that story 200 times, right, to him. He's like, oh my gosh, whatever, Dad. I want to go with my buddy. But God is with us like that, right? Like, he, God doesn't ever promise to, like, pluck us out of the pain, to remove us from the hard times we have to go through. But he does promise that he will be with us. Listen to Psalm chapter 16, verse eight. I love this. David says, I know the Lord is with me always. I will not be forsaken for he is right beside me. David walked in this confidence that God was with him always in all circumstances. And the more you learn and how to pray and the more you practice prayer and the more you practice the presence of God as this old monk uh, coined that phrase, Brother Lawrence says, we practice the presence of God, keeping God in our mind every moment. You know, just to practice that, it's really difficult. It's, uh, to, Paul says, pray continually, right, without ceasing. Well, you can't do that by closing your eyes and bowing your head. Like you, you just like you never eat, you never sleep, you never have conversation, you die, right? Like all that. Uh, pra- keeping God in your mind, understanding, believing, um, feeling even, knowing in your bones that God is with you. Uh, one of my first experiences of, of paying attention to the Spirit of God leading me to His presence. Um, I was in Bible college here at Ozark and um, I, was, uh, I wasn't engaged yet, I was, I was dating the girl that I eventually married, and we were going on a date. And it was a Friday or Saturday, and we didn't go out very often because we both worked full-time uh, jobs and went to school. And, um, and so I was all cleaned up. I worked at a sports bar, and I worked at my dad's like, uh, entertainment place that had go-karts. And so I was greasy a lot, but I cleaned up real good. I had kind of long hair, and it was all fixed up. I had nice khaki shorts on. I had a nice shirt on. I don't know why this was cool, but my sister had brought, bought me this gold chain the year before, and I wore it. I don't know if you're any of the adults or Friends fans, but it was kind of like Joey and Chandler's little friendship bracelet. But I wore it and I thought it was cool. But I, I mean, I looked good. It was, uh, you know, anyway, so I'm, I'm in, the, I, but I had to go to the mall before I went and picked up uh, Amy. And I, don't, I have no idea what, what I was doing. I can't remember what I was getting, but I was going to the mall and I was going into the food court and there were these, there were these kids, um, you know, I was guessing ninth grade, 10th grade, like sitting in a circle, sitting down, in front of the doors to go in. Like where you had to like walk around them. There was this, two old, this older couple, these two people, and they were just looking. But these were, I don't know if the, the, the term goth, if you know what that is, you're just still around, but like um, they were definitely like in the, in the goth type crowd. And, uh, and you know, like I would see people, and so people were scared of them because you know they got makeup on and their fingernails are painted and whatever, and they look weird to old people. And I'm like, sucker, I'm not walking around you. So I walk right in between them. Whoa. You know, walk in, walk inside. And I go, but I, but I overhear them when I'm coming out. They're still there when I come out. 
And they're talking about this place here in Joplin that used to be called The Bridge. They'd gone to The Bridge to like a concert or something and there'd been a, a Christian speaker and they were talking about that but they were making fun of it. And he said this or whatever and I walked over him again and I overheard that and I'm walking to my car and very clearly in my spirit, right, I didn't hear a voice but God was like, hey, go talk to them. Right, go talk to them. And I said what all godly people do when God speaks. I said, no, right? I'm like, God, I'm in Joplin, Missouri, man. I could spit and it would probably land on a Christian. Like send someone else, right? Like I never get to go out with Amy. Just wanna go on a date, right? This, I can tell it's gonna be a minute if I go talk to these guys. And I get in my, uh, my beautiful 1984 Buick Skylark, right? And I start to drive out and I get convicted and I turn back in and I go to park and then I argue again. I'm like, God, come, seriously. Somebody, and I tried to look and I was hoping they were gone. They're still there. And so I, but I started to leave, you know, and then I came back. Finally, I'm like, this is gonna take forever. Arguing, right? Oh, Jonah, right? Like all this kind of stuff. Okay, I parked. I, I, you know, I get out of the car. I kick the door shut, not because I was mad. The, the Skylark, if you, you, you couldn't just shut it, you had to kick it. Anyway, so I, I walk to, and I just decide, like, I don't, have, I don't have time to go at this the wise way, so I'm just going to go for it, right? So I sit down Indian style, and I'm like, hey, uh, God told me to come and talk to you guys. And I was hoping for, like, <laughs> peace out, bro, and them just to, like, run away, and I'd be like, all right, sweet, I tried, and go on a date. And they're like, really? How does that work? Oh, man. Look, I overheard you talking, and so we just began to talk. And then they asked me for a ride. And I'm like, all right, come on. Let's go now, though, because I, I got a date. And uh, so we go, to the, we go get in the car, and I take them home. There are four guys, and they all get out except the guy riding shotgun. And he stays in the car, and he shuts the door. Long story short, and this part's going to sound weird, and I'm not going to give the details, and that's okay. It can just be a little weird, okay? But um, he, he made a move on me. And uh, he was homosexual, evidently. And... Uh, and I was like, no thank you, right? Um, and he got really awkward and started to get out of the car. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Shut, shut the door. Can we, can we still talk for a minute? And we just began to talk about Jesus. And I'd already shared the gospel with all of these guys. And I said, can I pray for you, man? Like, you know, we talked about some different things. And he got out of the car and I drove and I picked my wife up and I never met those guys again. And I have no idea what God did with that. Here's what I know. God spoke to my heart. And I was obedient, I was paying attention, and I obeyed, and God was at work in something. But God was with me, with his presence. And paying attention to that, practicing that presence, God often speaks. God, is, uh, God goes with us through his paper. Now, every one of these that I'm going to use, right, as a point is going to have a P word. Because I went to Ozark and took preaching classes, bro, okay? So we're all going to have peas, and it makes my OCD personality, it just feels so good, okay? So paper is my funky little silly way of just saying the Bible, right? Although some of you, you're like me, and you read the Bible on screens now, so it doesn't make any sense. But I couldn't think of a P word. So if you've got one that's digital, that's a P word, you know, hook me up, let me know later, okay? But God goes with me through his paper. Um, you ever wake up in the middle of the night? And you, well, maybe you don't, but I'll tell you about me. I wake up a lot in the middle of the night and have to go to the bathroom because I'm 41 and that's just how it goes, right? And, um, but there's so many times I wake up, even though I have my, my phone and it's got a little flashlight, I wake up and I try and like there's something in the middle of the floor and I kick it, right? And then my wife wakes up, right? And she's like, are you okay? And I'm on the ground going, I've fallen and I can't, you know, I'm just a stupid old joke. And, but she, you know, she just giggles and goes back to sleep. And finally, I make my way to the bathroom, you know, and really what I need to do is grab my phone and use the little flashlight and I would then be safe, right? And life can be dark and difficult. And the Bible, part of God's paper, part of the, the purpose in that is to shine light on life, to give us wisdom to live by, to help uh, gain perspective um, in the world that we live in. Listen to, to David in Psalm chapter 119, which by the way, that entire chapter is all about the word of God. But in verses 105 through 107, I wanna read it from the message translation. David says to God, by your words, I can see where I'm going when I get up to go to the bathroom. Okay, the last part's just for me, not David. But they throw, God, God your word, throw a beam of light 
on my dark path. I've committed myself and I'll never turn back from living by your righteous order. Everything's falling apart on me, God. Put me together again with your word. David had high expectations of the word of God. He believed that by, by God's word, he could see better in life. And not necessarily just with his eyes, but with the eyes of his heart and his soul and his spirit. God goes with us through his paper. And God goes with us through his people. Other Christians. Christians in your life. Friends, uh, pastors, godly mentors, godly parents, godly coaches. God goes with you through his people. The Bible says the church the, is the body of Christ. The church that we are God's royal nation of priests. That you and I, we, we are priests, a royal priesthood, right? Like we are the people of God. And Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Very short verse. He says, so, because you're the people of God, encourage each other and build each other up. This word uh, encourage, it literally means to come to the side of somebody standing right here, right? That, that to encourage them, you come to their side. And so you can encourage people with words, right? Um, every morning, I have this thing that I started saying back when Asher, my oldest, uh, started going to kindergarten. And now I drop both of my boys off at different schools. One goes to middle school, one goes to the grade school. And every morning when I drop them off, I say to them, and, th and sometimes Silas will repeat it before I can say it because he thinks that's fun. But every morning I'll say, hey, bless people with your words, remember the Lord, and remember, remember, and they know, and it's part of the fun little thing, and I make it stupid and dramatic, but I'm like, hey, hey, also, guys, don't forget, dad loves you, right? And they know, and they're like, I know, dad, lo I love you too, dad, lo even the 13 year I love you too, dad, I love you. He's getting that voice thing, he's got a little peach fuzz, and it's just a whole new world, it's good. But God goes with you through his people, and part of that is to encourage one another, to come alongside one another. It's part of what God uses when we go through the good and when we go through the bad. The scriptures teach about mourning, crying with those who cry, right? But it talks about celebrating and rejoicing with those who rejoice. Listen, be that kind of person. I mean, God goes with you through people, but I'm telling you, be part of God's hands and God's feet. You be that kind of friend, that kind of person. So that even with girls, even the girl that's super pretty and gets all the attention already, when something great happens to her, rejoice with her. God will change your heart from it and you'll become a person like God, right? Like guys, you have a, you have a friend that goes through something tough even though it may, maybe it's just not super cool in your guy circle to be someone that's encouraging with your words or like, you know, hey man, I heard about what happened. I'm really sorry. I'll be praying for you. Do that. Be that kind of person because here's what's happening. If God goes with us through his people, when you're encouraging someone for the Lord, you're being God's hands and God's feet. You're being used by God. But God also goes with you through his people. It's part of why we do small groups, right? It's part of why we do church. We come together to be lifted, to be lifted up, to be built up, to be encouraged. So I'm sitting on my bed, 10 years old, waiting on pops, right? Not convicted about the, the sin of stealing. Uh, not afraid of my dad, but love him so much, respect him so much. So nervous about how he will now see me. And my dad gets home and he comes in, suit and tie. Uh, he was a salesman at the time. He came in, he sat on my bed, very gentle, soft-spoken like always, and, um, and he asked me some questions. How many times have you, have you stolen from Mr. Wallace? And I told him it was about 10 times. And he, we figured up, and he figured up about how much money that would be. After, this was, of course, after he asked me a bunch of questions about what he knew I knew, but he wanted me to say it about, you know, why we don't steal, you know. And he explained you know, about how this is Mr. Wallace's job. This is how he provides for his family. You didn't just steal from Mr. Wallace. You actually stole from Mr. Wallace's family. And then I started to feel bad, right? And uh, so he tells me, you need to go get $10 out of, your, out of your piggy bank. I had like this football piggy bank, right? Get $10 out to give to Mr. Wallace. And so I went to the piggy bank. I got out $10 and I turned around. My dad had his wallet out and he had a $10 bill. And I said, dad, I, I'm supposed to pay for this. I'm the one that did it. I, you told me, and he goes, no, no, no. When you steal from somebody, you don't just pay them back what you stole, you give them double. Because you didn't just steal from him, you disrespected him as, as a person, as a human being. And you need to pay back double. And I said, okay, well, I'll get it from my piggy bank. And because and, I'm like, I don't want my dad to 
pay for this. And, uh, and he said, no, 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 Dusty. He said, you listen to me. And he got serious. And he said, you're my son. And when you do good things, when you, when you do well at sports and people praise you in front of me, I get so proud, right? Because I taught you how to play that sport. I get proud. And, you know, every once in a while when you actually get a good grade, and I get excited, and I, I'm proud of you. I, I do the homework with you. And I, he said, so when you do knuckleheaded things like this, I have to take some responsibility. I'm your dad. I'm the one in charge of teaching you. And I mean, I was just like, ugh. So he said, you will take my $10, and you will add that as the double portion because you've disrespected this man. So we drove down to uh, Broadway Market. We got out. He explained to me what I needed to say and all these things, you know. We got out of the car. And he put his hands on both of my shoulders um, behind me. And he walked with me the whole time. My dad never, ever said a word to Mr. Wallace other than hello. And uh, Mr. Wallace kept looking above me to my dad. But like they, and I'm sure there was like physical communication, like body language communication. But I went in, I gave him the $10. As I've stolen from you about 10 times. And here's this, but I need to pay you double because I've disrespected you and your family. And I'm so sorry, sir. Um, you know, please forgive me and all this. And, and he kept looking at my dad and, okay, and shook my hand and thanked me and all that. And we, we walked out. My dad still had his hands on my shoulder, shoulders all the way to the car. And he, this, this is back in the 80s. So, you know, I didn't have to sit in the back and any kind of weird thing. And I just sat up front and we didn't even wear seat belts. But he sit, brought me to the passenger side and put me in. And he squatted down and he began to talk to me again. And he said something like this. He said, Dusty, you're gonna have a lot of choices as you get older to do the wrong thing. <laughs> And my dad, he told this story a lot, so it's, it, it was always fresh. Well, so some of my men, memories a little faded, but he told the story so many times, I have his, his memories in my head. But, um, but he said to me, Dusty, I have a feeling that you will get in some more trouble as you get older, which my dad was a prophet, <laughs> because I indeed did. But he said, but when you come to a decision point like stealing, here's what I want you to remember. And my dad was brilliant in this, because he knew right and wrong Doing the right thing because it was right was not going to grab my heart. But he said, when you're faced with something like this, I want you to remember whose son you are. You're my son. You're my boy. You're Frizzell. And I want you to act like one. You know how I live. I want you to live like that, Dusty. Can you do that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can. Man, my dad's words have been like a flashlight especially through my, my teenage years, right? And he's been dead now almost nine years and still things he said to me as a kid and as an adult are, are just there. And I, I think about th those moments with his hands on my shoulders and there were other moments where I messed up way bigger than, uh, than stealing that my dad was with me, you know, afterwards, present with me, right? Didn't excuse it, didn't justify it, but his love was always was always there. And God is the same way. God, God is with you even in your sin. To, to say that God can't be in the presence of sin is to read something other than the Bible. Adam and Eve sinned and guess who showed up right away while they were still sinning? They were lying to him, right? That Adam blamed it Eve and Eve blamed the snake like God's right there. Jesus took our sin, right? The curtain was ripped. The very presence of God has been wide open for all to come. God is with you always. He will not excuse your sin. He will not justify your sin, but God is with you. God sees you as you are. He's not disgusted. He already knew and he loves you. And God promises, promises, promises through Jesus, through the cross, through the resurrection, that he will be with you, that his presence, his paper, the word of God, you've got it. It's like a flashlight. And there's people all around that you can look up to, that you can have friendships like this with. God is with you. And that's not only good news. Man, that is great, great news. And look at that, man. I'm like super early. That's just so good. Can I just preach another sermon? No, I'm just kidding. Here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you to close your eyes. Um, even if you don't want to like participate in what I'm going to do, I'm still going to encourage you just to close your eyes. I'm not going to make you raise your hand or anything like that. It won't be a salvation call. I just want to, uh, I want to have a moment where you do something like this. Now you can, you can replace this with any phrase that you want. But something like this, God is with me. It can be, God, I know you're with me. But the 
fewer words, sometimes the better. So just pay attention. And the only reason I'm asking you to close your eyes is just to focus, to not be distracted. And just something like God is with me. And still with your eyes closed, I want to challenge you as you're saying that. As you're saying it in your mind, as you're feeling it in your spirit, I want to challenge you. And no shame in this. Maybe, maybe you'll be able to do this for 13 seconds, maybe 13 minutes, maybe for the majority of the day, which will be unbelievable. But I want to challenge you that for the rest of this day that you might try to hold that thought in your mind. God, with me. Jesus, with me. Whenever you're ready, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to pray, and, uh, and we're going to spend some time believing as a community. You can stand now. Believing as a community that God is here with us. That as the old scripture says, that God inhabits the praise of his people. And so as we sing these songs, as we make these declarations, um, may you know as a part of God's people, as a part of God's gathering, may you know that God is here, that God is with us and God is with you. And may you be a part of these praises. May you May you be a part of God inhabiting this next thing we're going to do together as a community. And let me pray a blessing over you. Lord Jesus, God, for the one who is still opening themselves up and working on believing and accepting and receiving this truth that you see them and you love them just as they are. Lord, may they also know that you are with them and that you are for them. And God, if you are with us and if you are for us, what force can be against us? Nothing. Not even our own thoughts. So Lord, as we hold this this truth in our mind, and maybe for some it's not a truth yet, it's a hope. It's a fingers crossed this thought that you are with us as we hold that in our minds today. May its reality do something profound in our spirit. Lord, as we go to lunch today with our friends, may this thought that you are with us, may it change the way we speak to the people around us. May May it change the way we laugh God, may it change the way we see the world. May it change the way we see an opportunity to serve. May it change the way, God, we pay attention to those around us when we see someone hurting or when we see someone celebrating. God, may we, may we encourage, may we build up, may we be with others. And God, my hope is that it will be rooted in this practice and experiment of holding this truth in our minds, this hope that you are with us. And for God, God, for those that it's still a fingers crossed kind of thing right now, God, they may, may they experience your presence today. Maybe even in this moment, as your people sing, and as we celebrate, and as we declare the great wonders, the great works, and the great love of our Jesus, I pray in his name, amen.